crashes during an emergency landing after an engine fails. Investigators are trying to find out why. Good evening. I'm Mary Alice Williams. It is a story of overwhelming tragedy and remarkable survival. United Flight 232. It begins in Denver. The DC-10 takes off on a flight to Chicago, its ultimate destination, Philadelphia. But somewhere over Iowa, one of its engines fails. The plane is diverted to Sioux City. There, as it attempts an emergency landing, the plane crashes, breaks apart, burns. 290 people were on board. Our latest information is that 100 or more were killed, but 186 survived. We begin our coverage tonight with NBC's Roger O'Neill in Sioux City. Many of the bodies are believed to be... The DC-10 exploded in flames when it hit the ground just short of a runway at the Sioux City, Iowa airport. Uh, the northeast, it uh, came across the runway. The only discernible piece left of the big plane was what appears to be a section of the fuselage. The pilot's first report of trouble was that he blew the number two engine, the one in the tail of the plane. While there was nothing left of the United jet, there were survivors, including some who walked away from the crash. United Flight 232 left Denver en route to Philadelphia with an intermediate stop in Chicago. It was fully loaded, 287 passengers and a crew of 11. United's chief DC-10 training manager, Mike Downs, told NBC News he cannot believe the plane lost all of its hydraulics, as has been reported. Downs said a DC-10 has eight backup systems to its three main hydraulic pumps, and there has never been a total failure before. The United pilot at the controls of the ill-fated plane was talking with company maintenance managers in San Francisco for at least 25 minutes before the plane went down. United classified the problems aboard the plane as a red alert, indicating grave problems. I could not speculate what, what occurred. Obviously, the accident occurred on landing in an emergency situation. The DC-10 almost made it, missing the runway by just 75 feet. He looked like he had enough altitude to make, to make the runway but at the last minute he lost altitude and uh, he crashed. we we'll see what the results are. Roger O'Neill, NBC News, Sioux City, Iowa. The plane had been delayed briefly in Denver with electrical problems. David Landsberger was one of the passengers aboard that flight. He joins us now from Briarcliff Briar College near Sioux City. David, can you tell us what happened from the moment you knew there was trouble? Well, uh, about a half an hour before we crashed, there was an explosion, and I guess that's, that was our first sign. We lost some altitude, um, but they announced that we'd be okay, we'd just be a little late, um, and uh, everything seemed fine for 10 or 15 minutes, and then the plane started kind of rolling back and forth, and the engines went powered up and powered down a few times. Did the pilot warn you that you were in trouble? Yeah, around 15 minutes before, or 10 minutes before, he said that we would have to uh, divert and land in Sioux City. Uh, and he said that he wasn't going to fool us, that it was going to be an extremely rough landing, uh, and that the stewardesses would teach us how to brace ourselves and how to evacuate in case it became necessary. And then they did that, and we drilled a couple times and how to brace ourselves and and uh, where to go and which exits were closest to us. And uh, four minutes before, they warned us that we were going to touch down. And then about two minutes before, we were told to brace ourselves. And we all braced ourselves. And that's when then we hit. Des we hit real hard. That's when I cut my head a little bit. And Describe it, what happened. Did the fuselage fill with smoke immediately, David? Did no, the emergency exits work as, as you were instructed to use them? Well, it all kind of went topsy-turvy because we turned upside down. Uh, we skidded down the runway on our sides for a while and then flipped up upside down and we skidded down upside down. And when we came to a stop, we were all hanging from the ceiling, uh, strapped to our seats. Um, I let myself out and the people around me did. And the emergency door we were supposed to go out, we couldn't find. It was closed. It wasn't open. And we looked the other way and we could see daylight. So we all started heading for the daylight. There was no smoke. There was no panic. We just started walking down the aisle, which was really the ceiling, climbing over the debris and the overhead compartments and stuff towards daylight. And we just stepped out, basically out of the middle of the plane into the cornfield. There was just no door. There was no end to the plane. We just stepped right into the middle of the cornfield. And then everybody just started saying, get away from the plane, get away from the plane. And we started running down the cornfield you know, to get, to get away all in the same basic direction. Um, but I didn't see any smoke. 
a, a little bit up front, I saw, which is why I headed towards the back. Until I got like a couple hundred feet away from the plane, I turned around and I saw the smoke, and I, I just didn't even believe what I saw when I turned around. I know that when events are happening that fast, David, all you can think about is survival. At what point did it dawn on you what had really happened? When I turned around, and, and actually when I got to the other side of the cornfield and climbed up the, there's a little rise and a little road, and I turned around, and that's when I could see that the airplane was on its side or upside down and burning, and I could see the other section of plane and see that we were near an airport. I mean, until then, I thought we were just in the middle of a cornfield, and we had just turned upside down. I had no idea that the plane had broken up or that we were anywhere near the airport or anything. One more question. Where were those who made it out with you sitting? Uh, we, uh, I've met people from row nine back to about 20, everybody from about row nine back to row 20 pretty much got out that I've met. Uh, I have not met a single person in front of row nine, which would be first class. I didn't meet anybody that had gotten out from first class, which would have been in front. And I didn't meet anybody beyond row 27. Okay, thank you very much. We're glad you're safe, David Landsberger from New Jersey. We're going to go back to NBC's Roger O'Neill, who is standing by live in Sioux City. Roger, I know you flew to Sioux City with some United DC-10 experts who had been monitoring some of the, uh, the crosstalk as the pilot was talking his way down. Can you tell us about that? It's interesting, Mary Alice. Uh, Mike Downs is the DC-10 chief training officer for United, based in Denver. And he was listening in on the conversation that was taking place between the pilot of the DC-10 and the maintenance uh, supervisors in the San Francisco airport, where maintenance headquarters for United are. That conversation, according to Mr. Downs, one, the pilot never said to them that he had total hydraulic failure. And in fact, Down says he can't believe there was total hydraulic failure because this airplane circled this airport three times before it crashed. If you had total hydraulic failure, Downs thinks it would have crashed right away. Another interesting piece of information that just came in, 50 miles east of here, east of Sioux City in Alta, Iowa, in a field, there is a large piece of an airplane. It is believed to be from the tail section of this DC-10, 50 miles east of here. And that might have happened while the pilot was making concentric circles as he tried to, to land at Sioux City? One of those three circles, uh, obviously it came off during that time. The pilot almost, in fact, made it to Sioux City, Mary Alice. He landed on one of the closed runways. It was certainly still operable to handle an emergency. But he landed 75 feet to the left of the center line of that closed runway. That's how close he came to landing safely here at Sioux City. Roger, you've said that uh, the experts with whom you spoke said that there were eight redundancy hydraulic systems in that plane, that there was no way that the hydraulic systems could have all failed, and that the pilot didn't say so. Somebody said so to federal officials, because we've been hearing that for about five hours now. Can you clear that up for us? Well, as I understand it from Mr. Downs, who again was listening to the conversation between the pilot and the maintenance people in San Francisco, the pilot was talking to them. The co-pilot was talking to the air traffic controllers. One or the other may have said one or another thing. But Mr. Downs said in the conversation that he heard, the pilot never said that he had total hydraulic failure. And in fact, there has never been total hydraulic failure on a DC-10 since this fleet has been in the air. There's three main hydraulic pumps, one to each engine. There are eight backups to that and three backups after that. So there's some 10 or 11 backup systems of the hydraulic systems. That's not to say, however, that it may not have happened right prior to the, to the landing on the ground. Okay, thank you very much, Roger. Roger O'Neill. There are always a lot of unanswered questions and some contradictions as investigators try to see, seek through the, the wreckage as to what happened. And uh, National Transportation Safety Board team is on its way to the crash site. NBC's Andrea Mitchell has been with them through the day. Andrea, what have you got? Mary Alice, federal aviation officials say that the pilot was talking to air controllers all the way down as he struggled to control his plane. There is an obvious conflict here 
and they say that the cockpit was talking to the air traffic controllers. It is conceivable it was the co-pilot, not the pilot. But they say, according to their information, that the pilot first reported engine failure in engine two. That's the rear engine here at the back of the plane. He then, they say, reported complete failure of the hydraulic systems, the systems that control the wheels, the flaps, and other control surfaces on the wings and the tail. And they still say they have no reason to doubt that report. Officials are speculating that parts from this failed engine here penetrated the fuselage, damaging the control systems. They say the pilot then had a very difficult time bringing the plane down, doing several 360-degree turns, but was able to crank down his landing gear. Now, tonight, a crash team, as you say, left Washington to join investigative units at the scene. Among them will be the um, uh, power plants group, the systems group, which will look at uh, the operation of the aircraft systems. Power plants will look at the engines. We'll have a structures group that will be looking at the airframe, a um, operations group that will be looking at the operation of the aircraft, the background of the pilots, also a human performance group, a weather group, and a survival factors group. The plane was 15 years old. Tomorrow, officials will examine its maintenance records. The Associated Press is now reporting that federal records indicate past problems with the very engine suspected of failing just before the crash. By the way, officials are very hopeful of recovering the flight recorder, and perhaps that will clear up this uh, very important contradiction between what Roger O'Neill was hearing from United officials and what federal officials are saying they heard from the cockpit. Mary Alice? Okay, thank you very much, Andrea. This morning, Rabbi and Mrs. Avraham Brownstein of Denver put their nine-year-old son, Yisroel, on his first trip on an airplane all by himself. It was United Flight 232. Brownstein was going to Philadelphia to visit his buddies. First plane in his life. And he's swelly. And he's alive. He made it. And he asked the social worker. Can you stop? Can you okay. stop? Okay. No, we want okay, to go. We want to go. No, there's a plane. I don't want to miss the plane. What's your name? Are you going to Sioux City now? We're going to Sioux City. United has provided a flight for those who want to go at 640. Grandma Brownstein, what's your first name? My first name is Avraham. His name is Swelly. And, and he's okay. He broke his arm. He always said he wanted to have a broken arm like his other friends. Well, now he's got one. Joy on a day that will not soon be forgotten. Terrible trip. United 232. From CBS News headquarters in New York, here is Charles Perot. Good evening. United Flight 232 was bound from Denver to Chicago this afternoon when an engine apparently blew up over Iowa, damaging the tail of the plane. The pilots reported complete hydraulic failure. They said they had no flaps, very little control of the plane, but they worked desperately to bring the plane into the airport at Sioux City for an emergency landing. They nearly made it. But a wing touched the ground, the plane cartwheeled and broke up and burst into flames. 181 survivors were counted at local hospitals a short time ago, some of them badly injured but alive after that spectacular crash. As federal aviation authorities headed for the uh, crash site, there were reports from Philadelphia that this same 15-year-old DC-10 developed electrical problems yesterday in Denver and again this morning in Philadelphia. We uh, know that the crew and the passengers of the United Airlines DC-10 knew that their plane was in trouble for about half an hour before it finally crashed in flames so spectacularly. Correspondent Richard Schlesinger tells the story of the final moments of Flight 232. Videotape of the cartwheeling wreckage is chilling, and it is amazing that anyone lived through the crash. When the right wing dipped, it slid on the runway. Oh, she's I don't know, about 100 feet. As it slid on the runway, an explosion occurred. It sent the fuselage up in the air, spinning off that way. Part of the fuselage burned here, part of it burned right about there. It's amazing, it was awful. Many passengers, some reports say more than 160, more than half the total number aboard, lived through this. They had plenty of time to prepare. According to one passenger, the crew warned them about 30 minutes before the crash that the plane's right engine had blown and damaged the tail. The FAA said the plane's hydraulic systems had failed, which would make the plane almost impossible to control. It circled before the passengers were warned to prepare for a crash landing. It was all pretty normal, and then when we hit, it was just 
Yeah. Just a tumble at that point. In the plane crash, they go upside down. The plane went upside down? What do you remember about it? Where I unbuckled my seatbelt. You unbuckled your seatbelt? How did you get out? The back of the airplane. In Chicago, relatives of passengers braced for the worst in a private area set up by United. But a lot of families got good news tonight, news that their relatives were among the lucky. Abraham Brownstein heard his son got out with only a minor injury. And he's okay, he broke his arm. He always said he wanted to have a broken arm like his other friends. Well, now he's got one. How old is he? He's nine years old. About two dozen passengers walked away from the wreckage, according to one survivor, with just mud and shock. As all the hospitals in the area quickly filled up with the wounded, one rescue worker reported the pilot was treated for injuries and was in satisfactory condition. The co-pilot was reportedly taken into surgery. If they survive, they can be expected to detail what happened aboard the jumbo jet, what led to the crash of United 232. Richard Schlesinger, CBS News, New York. And as we say, the pilot and co-pilot amazingly are among 181 people we counted still alive from that crash just a short time ago. CBS News correspondent Frank Courier is at the airport in Sioux City where the crash occurred this afternoon. We want to go to him now for the latest. Frank. Charles, the uh, Sioux Gateway Airport here tonight sealed off uh, about two and a half hours ago. The NTSB took over control of the investigation. The National Guard, the state police are assisting about 100 crash investigators at the scene. Behind me, you can't really see it. It's under searchlights about a quarter of a mile uh, away behind the chain link. On the runway is about a 30-foot section of fuselage, all that's left uh, in a little bit of a, a tail section out on the runway, all that's left of Flight 232. The numbers we're told tonight, and I guess they, they seem to be conflicting back and forth. We were told earlier 170 two survivors. Six of them uh, had died, however, at area hospitals tonight, leaving 166. Those numbers may change, of course, during the night. And as you mentioned, uh, we're, uh, four cockpit crew members, including pilot, co-pilot, believed to be among those survivors. The black box, we're told, has not been found. Very little information tonight coming out of either the FAA or United Airlines so far. We have been told, however, by the uh, Sioux City City Manager here at a briefing that uh, one of the wing engines uh, of Flight 232 fell off the aircraft about 90 miles northeast of here, near Storm Lake, Iowa, at which point uh, the pilot circled back to, to make his emergency crash landing. Uh, that's about all we know here uh, tonight, Charles. Thank you, Frank. Of course, it's going to be up to federal investigators to figure out what went so terribly wrong aboard Flight 232 as it was making a apparently routine trip from Denver to Chicago. Correspondent Mark Phillips, who covers uh, aviation for CBS News, tells us what we do know right now. Mark? Charles, there is still very little to go on in determining the exact cause of the crash, but the fact that there were survivors and witnesses on the ground has led to some informed speculations. Passengers, as we've reported, said there was a loud bang, followed by the pilot saying he had lost the use of one engine. Pieces of the fuselage and of an engine were found about 75 or so miles from the crash site, around where the pilot turned towards Sioux City. The thinking is that exploding parts from that engine could have severed hydraulic control lines to the stabilizer and the rudder. In fact, there is a late report tonight from the FAA's uh, Records Bureau in Oklahoma City that says this particular engine on the plane had had previous problems and that this is the engine suspected of blowing up. However, NTSB investigators who left Washington for Sioux City this evening will be looking at why the backup hydraulic system or the mechanical cable system may have failed as well. We'll have a structures group that will be looking at the airframe, a... Um operations group that will be looking at the operation of the aircraft, the background of the pilots. The pilot radioed there had been complete hydraulic breakdown. That is puzzling to aviation experts, but it is clear there was significant loss of control. The report we had is that the airplane could only make turns to the right. Uh, and I don't want to speculate at all on what that might mean in terms of what happened to the aircraft. The DC-10 has had a history of hydraulic problems. Two crashes, one in Chicago and one in Paris, have been traced to hydraulic failure. In fact, there were scores of minor problems with early versions of the plane that led the FAA to require a major overhaul of the DC-10's hydraulic system. This particular plane, a 15-year-old model, had spent last night in Philadelphia, where its hydraulics were checked in the routine pre-flight inspection. But this plane has had problems lately. Twice in the past two days, it has been delayed on the ground. The plane lost electric power while taxing and had to be towed to a place where mechanics could restart it. Charles? Mark, thank you. 
Uh, to get a little bit more insight into what might have caused the United crash today, we're joined now from Washington by John Casey. Mr. Casey is an aviation technical consultant. Uh, Mr. Casey, you may have just heard Mark Phillips report that the uh, DC-10 uh, had uh, had some electrical difficulties in recent days. Uh, uh, could there be any connection between that fact and that crash today? I sort of doubt it. Uh, no. The electrical system uh, could be used to feed emergency hydraulic pumps, but uh, I doubt that. But if it were the the, uh, the tail engine, the center one, and the uh, configuration of the DC-10 that uh, that blew up. Could that have uh, fairly easily caused the hydraulic problems that the pilots reported? Yes, sir, it could. It could have caused a failure of uh, the systems feeding, feeding the uh, stabilizer and the elevator, and uh, possibly the rudder, and also possible uh, cable damage. Uh, well, if you lose uh, your hydraulic system on a DC-10, uh, how, how do you control the airplane? Uh, there are usually redundant systems. I'm not an expert on a DC-10. But there are always redundant systems on all the transport category airplanes, either hydraulic or manual. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Casey. Yes. It's clear that the full story of the crash of United 232 remains to be told. Many people were killed this afternoon, but this crash will be remembered for the numbers of people who were not. Uh, among them was a man named Cliff Marshall from Columbus, Ohio, one of the passengers. He said the plane came down. It bounced twice, it flipped into the air. We were sitting there upside down. It began to fill up with smoke. He said, then God opened a hole in the basement, the bottom of the plane, and I pushed a little girl out. He said, I grabbed another, kept pulling them out until they didn't come no more. And then he said he ran. Amazingly, Cliff Marshall and 180 other people, at last count, passengers and crew aboard United 232, survived a terrible airplane crash today. I'm Charles Carroll, CBS News, New York. Good night. This is CBS. The home run.